So I'm hoping that this auto focuses somehow. Um, so um, I'm just gonna roll with it. Okay. So uh, Miyako Kawakami, I believe that's how it's pronounced. M Miyako, Miyako. I'm sorry, Kawakami. Um, breasts and eggs uh, is I want to say the short story. The t the of the title short story um, was published in a shorter kind of some variation was published in uh, 08 or 2009, and then this kind of 450, 500 page version was, um, which expands on that kind of initial thing about the two sisters is, um, now, uh, I think was only published about, I want to say 2018, I think, so not too long ago, um, and yeah, this is the second novel I've read by Kawakami, um, I'm still trying to get a kind of grasp on it, I did hear about it by, via, um, Haruki Murakami, who said that it was, he was, she was, one of these bright up-and-coming Japanese novelists of her time, and I did read Heaven by her, which I believe I did a review on. And yeah, so this book concerns a uh, young woman named uh, Natsuku Nes Natsumi, who is the narrator of the novel. Uh, so first person, she's recalling kind of these life events of her growing up in Tokyo, and um, well, no, she's based in Tokyo, but she's, um, it takes place over the span of her life, but it starts out with her and her sister, uh, her sister, Makiko, um, and her 12-year-old daughter, and, um, Natsuko, um, is basically trying to, um, con uh, convince her sister not to have a breast augmentation, uh, surgery. So she's seeking that, and she's basically going back and forth uh, from Tokyo to Osaka, and I think she's going to Osaka to look for some, like, a kind of the right surgeon, and she's, like, going through all these things, and there's a lot of um, interspersed different journals, like, you see journal entries, I'm not sure if you see that, where it says Dear Journal, and that's, I believe, that's, like, recalling to their childhood, that is Natsuku and Mikiko's childhood with her mother, which is a very turbulent childhood, and... Tragically, her their mom died pretty young, um, and they it was a very kind of up and down type of thing. Like they were, um, um, there's a pretty telling quote that I have here that I uh, ended up having to look online because I can't actually. I was I'm I'm not. I don't know if you've never noticed that I haven't confessed this if it's something to confess, but um, I am not a good like footnote. I'm not a good um, note taker as in as in using footnotes or using what's highlighter or. Uh, color-coded stuff like I'm not I'm not organized in that sense I'm organized in like every other way okay maybe not every way but in um, in so far of buying the books or getting through the books and, and uh, reading about like reading up articles and stuff like that or listening to interviews with authors I have done all that stuff you know like the Natalie Portman interview with um, uh, Kawakami but I you know I haven't actually done um, Footnotes, like, you know, like, I don't know, I don't want to call it footnotes. I think it's, uh, you know, I haven't actually, like, done notation or anything. Um, but I'd like to do, get better at that. But anyway, so, um, enough of my rambling. And so she talks about how, um, so she says earlier on in the novel, if you want to know how poor someone is growing up, ask them how many windows they had. Don't ask what was in their fridge or in their closet. The number of windows says it all. The, it says everything. If they had none, or maybe one or two, that's all you need to know. And yeah, that does that. That is an interesting kind of unique way of looking at um, growing up poor. Um, I mean, for me, I think like it has to do maybe with more of the metropolitan kind of area of Japan and Tokyo, especially being like a pretty major area, kind of content more um, densely populated area. I didn't come from. I came from the country, so maybe I come from kind of a lower-ish middle kind of working class. But, um, so we had a, you know, I grew up with a kind of spacious kind of, uh, fairly spacious, but we had an addition on it. So it was a kind of a country kind of almost a ranch style home. Um, but since we, you know, my family was pretty big, we had six kids. So I had to, we had to find some room to put everything, but put to place for everybody to accommodate. So basically, yeah, I did, but I did understand. I could kind of visualize that this is what Kiyokami is good at is making you kind of identify and visualize and, and be like, oh, I see where she's getting from that. Like the number of windows, because that was like a, in, that, that was an interesting kind of um, benchmark, I guess, of, of measuring that. Um, 
but yeah, she, uh, so basically, um, the, um, there's also some tension with her mother, too, um, and at one point, I don't think, uh, Midoriko actually speaks to her mother for, um, six months, I think, and so there's a big falling out, and, um, so those journal entries I talked about, um, but yeah, so one of them has something interesting, uh, that I'll just say right here, because it's like, uh, I luckily found it, um, yeah. so dear journal, lately my head hurts whenever I look at something, my head is pounding all the time, all these things come through as in, through my eyes, but how do they get out, as words, as tears, if those things are, uh, what if those things stop coming? What if I can't talk or cry no anymore? Everything is connected to my eyes. Will grow bigger and get bigger and bigger, making it even harder for me to breathe. Um, but yeah, that's like kind of a kid's idea of like what's going on. Like your body's changing, and um, I mean, there is a lot to be said of like a lot of different kind of um, even if it can be coming from the point of view as a guy, you know, like to be said about what the awkward kind of. Um, weirdness of growing up, how, just how, like, um, cumbersome, like, you navigating this, all these different peaks and valleys of, like, not knowing, like, you know, I, I know I certainly, uh, identified with that, but, uh, insofar as the, the way that the female body changes and, like, her, like, being more sensitive to surroundings or, or, you know, going through, um, more of a, the hormonal, you know, obviously the girl's hormonal cycle is a lot different than the guy's, I think. So it's like, a, um, some people, I've seen people, various people online on TikTok kind of giving quick kind of life advice saying like, oh, well, guys, they are, their hormonal cycles reset every 24 hours where a girl, or no, wait, I think she said 24 days where a girl sets, resets every, I can't remember what, what they said, but anyway, but it was something that I just thought it was kind of simplistic of reducing people down to like your your hormones and everything. Guys don't need that because they they get over things quicker. They're more easier to appease and just be like, I just want all I want to do is just have my, um, you know, my this that and that need satisfied. I want to work and get and focus my work, my goals, and ambitions, and for you not to get in the way of that and blah blah blah. That's like for yes, that is for like some of the kind of stereotypically hegemonically. Um, masculine males, sure. And there's some people that do fit the bill of that, you know. Um, in the same way that tall, successive CEOs get, you know, they get paid higher, you know, than the shorter guys. Um, but I don't think that's like, I think that's kind of a, not a confirmation bias, but some kind of fallacy is going on because I think human nature is a lot more convoluted than that. So I don't think it has to do with um, simply just um, guys are different. Than, I, mean, I mean, I think you can. There are overlaps, you know. Some guys have feminine qualities a little bit. Um, you know, some girls have tomboyish qualities, and this has been going on for, the, for like, since the dawn of civilization. Like, there's been this, you know. Um, so, anyway. Um, but, yeah, so, basically, um, the narrator, Natsuku, ends up um, going into adulthood, and she herself is a writer, so it's a, kind of an interesting kind of meta underlying thing of, um, writing about writing, um, the author obviously being a writer, uh, writing about writing. I thought that was interesting. So, um, but it's, it never feels that way. It never feels like it's on its face. Like it's something that's trying to be super ingenious or super, it's, it's her uh, writing's like painfully, um, and very lovingly like simple and easy to access, but yet at the same time is like communicating a lot of depth to it. Like there's a lot of, poetry behind the words that are that are melded in that are like um and i feel like i'm not some critics have said that because of the japanese kind of culture like how <laughs> very japanese this is because with Mur murakami you sense that there's like a bit of um a little bit of a writing through the point of view of a japanese person but taking from other cultures like kafka on the shore um taking from the German kind of, you know, Czech kind of Eastern Europe culture or talking about maybe his love of jazz or, you know, his uh, love of classical music, again, very kind of Teutonic kind of European kind of stuff. But with this, um, it's strictly in, in, in uh, the best way, like very, very Japanese. Like she's, the language is so, I feel like what the, some of the critics were saying was, was that it, it was lost the... Um, social contour, which there's a definite kind of 
overlapping or very, very undercutting things about, you know, the, the body changing or, you know, like uh, the difference between men and women's duties and like what men expect of women, especially in Japan, kind of there's like underlying kind of still like a hierarchical kind of thing of like the patriarchy in Japan. I still was like a, a thing. I don't want to just throw that word around kind of glibly, but yeah, it is a, a, a kind of honor system, you know, as Mishima had that kind of um, very, very like kind of as, you know, masculine as he was, you know, he's very poetic and he was very, obviously he was, you know, gay as well. So it was an interesting kind of juxtapose or a kind of pairing, but Mishima also had, you know, he just like went with this duty bound, very like, this is the only way I would rather, you know, commit seppuku than go any other way. Like the shame is like, would out, would be, um, there would be no, the shame was no alternative for him. Like living a shameful, like hanging his life down or hanging his head down, um, in public. And yeah, that was no alternative. So, but yeah, I, I get how that, that kind of thing was probably still pervades to this day in Japan. Um, like that kind of, maybe that kind of bear it, you know, like that kind of like, um, and it's probably complicit. It's not like a, an explicitly radical thing. Like, you know, all the men are ever, you know, I, I just think it's more of a, like, and I don't want to just go it down to like, oh, it's just about dis dishonor or honor or whatever, but it, it does seem like that's like a little bit residual today, um, from what I've noticed. Um, but yeah, the, um, especially since it was like such a superpower too, like only less than 80 years ago, right? So you're seeing this great, you know, mammoth country, like on the small island that like has such mammoth power. Um, and yeah, so contending with all these other people, um, in the 20th century. So, um, but yeah, so basically the... Um, so she tries, um, Mitsuki, Natsuko, tries getting, um, she never has much luck with love and having, you know, she has like one kind of experience with a boy that she did love, but she didn't feel anything during the act of, you know, intimacy. Like she didn't feel any intimacy to, toward him. So what he, what she did, sorry, um, they broke up and they kind of had a, kind of had a, it was awkward between them and they didn't really keep up terms, and he, um, she basically wants to have, uh, artificial insemination to be able to have a kid because she doesn't feel anything for any guy, so it's like, she's, like, feeling like a very, there's a lot of, um, fears of motherhood of, of her now going into her late 30s, early 40s, and not really knowing where to put her time, and she feels like I've, I've, you know, I've already done my I kind of masterworks and I've already kind of worked on this book and this book and you know I've, I've written for a magazine and she's now ready to just kind of like put down that and just focus on a child she really does want a child she longs for one so she ends up um as a single woman looking through all these guys and then some of them are really creepy there's one guy who is just like super obsessed with his uh, with his own sperm <laughs> and it goes on for a long uh, this is where I kind of understand if people, like, kind of had a little bit, uh, you know, it, it was a little bit hard to read. But, yeah, he just went on. It was so creepy. He was just, like, talking about, like, my sperm. I, I've, you know, I've made sure that it was, like, fresh and that it was the best sperm and that my sperm is, like, anytime it's... I know for a fact that if you... My seed, like, if you uh, vouch... For, I can vouch for my seed because I know for a fact it will, like, be... Uh, it will be, like, what's the word? Like, forbearing and, like, you know, and, and, and like strong and I've, I've, I've done so I've, and that he said like one that as a kid, like he would, um, like he would like observe his sperm or whatever, <laughs> you know, and it was just like very, uh, after he was done, like on a microscope type of thing with the lab at school and it was just very, very eerie. Um, and she was like disgusted by that because now, because that ruined kind of the thing. Like she's very much still an idealist in that sense. Like she's like very much not, um, even even if it's like a kind of loveless transaction of just, you are just going to, you know, you know, like you're just going to um, donate, you know, like a, an, a, to a bank. Like it's like you're just going to make a deposit, you know, with, with your, uh, this thing and that's going to go there and then you're, and then it's all going to be done and, you know, it's like you don't even see them again. For her, it's important that she has like some good rapport with or connection with, I guess, the people that are, you know, offering her sperm. Um, and I imagine that's not, you know, that's probably speaking for a good amount of women as well. Like, I don't think it's maybe that uncommon, but, you know, it, it, these are, you know, 
fears that are expressed and um but yeah the um yeah so she also has a different under kind of stories that kind of weave in, in and out of that and that there's also a um a bar that's owned by i believe one of her siblings and the um there's also i love how it's like kind of a simple kind of thing where uh kawakami um is able to write about and, and also include so many different um not opposing but kind of converging narratives of different people's lives livelihoods and like not only just a bar of that her sister worked at but a bar that was also kind of the the hub of where all this kind of strange stuff at so there's characters that went to the bar and then how all these different kinds of things all kind of obliquely kind of um, maybe cr crossing paths with, with one another and i like how that narrative is like branches out like a tree because there's like you know roots of a tree at least because there's like one kind of um you can plant a seed i don't think with a novel and you can have like a very very kind of um ambitious kind of thing but um and but it really does take that one kind of seed of just kind of like planting that and then you know having it branch out into some kind of cohesive thing that will and that's how i feel i feel about um literature like hers or maybe something by Joyce Carol Oates or Murakami, they're able to kind of like, uh, Wallace too, like able to kind of have all these underlying kind of um, narratives and storylines that don't seem to be completely discursive and just kind of random. Like they have like meaning in a sense. And Joyce did this too, probably. Joyce was like a um, good example because he was able to kind of have all that kind of come to some whole an entity you know it wasn't just worthless rambling you know but um stream of consciousness obviously is the term i'm looking for but yeah it is all these different characters kind of apart in like the minor characters like her father that was kind of you know very um lazy and when you know he wouldn't he was very depressed and he didn't really ever mean he mistreated his mom and that's kind of like that kind of just that one character of him like interacts or that kind of affected the other character and, and you know his mom and therefore affects her childhood childhood and thus her life and the, thus the way she views life as well so it's like a kind of um i don't know dovetail effect but um not a cocktail party effect not there's not too much going on um i feel like some postmodern novels try to get a little bit like i felt like it's low calvino went a little bit too like kind of didactic going everywhere um but yeah, um, to the point where you couldn't really root for the characters. Where I think, what I, I think the good point is, is that with uh, uh, Mia Kwame's or um, Kawa Kwame, I'm sorry. Um, with this, is that you can kind of root for each character, um, aside from you, know, obviously, like the kind of really overtly creepy ones. But you can at least um, the main character. You know, you can at least root for her and her story. So, anyway, so that is all I have for. Um, Rest in eggs, and thanks for watching.